Well, good evening and welcome back to the Journey Home program. I'm your host, John Mark Grodi, here on EWTN. And we, once again, we have this great privilege to take this time together, having some coffee together, to reflect on our journeys. Uh, we were talking before the show today about, you know, the fact that when we, when we reflect on our own journeys, you know, on, on a conversion story, we're not, we're not uh, reflecting on a piece of art that we've created, but it's God's story, God, what God has done in our lives. And so every time we reflect on that, we discover new things. We, we peer in awe at God's amazing work. And so we're joined tonight by Father Stephen Hilgendorf, former Anglican priest. Uh, Father, thanks so much for joining us for today. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. I really appreciate you coming out, and, and I'm really excited about your story. We, we were talking beforehand, and um, I think we have lots in common, lots of, lots of shared interests, and a lot of neat parts of your journey I'm excited to dig into tonight. So thank Same you for here. being here. Thank you. Well, I'll invite you to go way back. Where does, where does your story start, Father? Well, I grew up in the Assembly of God uh, tradition. Uh, which of course is a Pentecostal charismatic uh, group. And um, so mo much of my life was spent there. And one of the beautiful things that I, I got out of that particular upbringing was um, not only a, a love for God and a love for the truth, but also um, an awareness of the Holy Spirit and his imminence in our life, the fact that he's very close to us and that we as Christians live in the power of the, of the Holy Spirit. Absolutely. So that has kind of been a golden thread that has, has run through my life, and I'm, I'm really quite grateful for it. And while, while you know, I might have some little critiques here and there, um, there's, there's definitely a beautiful thing in recognizing the role of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Um, when I was quite young, actually one of my first memories was of kneeling at, at my parents' uh, cedar chest um, and uh, praying the sinner's prayer and dedicating my life to the Lord. And um, I guess, you know, looking back now, um, you know, more than 30 years later, I'm, I'm, I, I'm really grateful that that was an offering to the Lord of my life um, that I've never really renounced or, yeah. or walked away from. And so I've, I've tempted to, been tempted to believe that my story is really just kind of not all that uh, important and it's kind of ordinary and uh, there's really nothing exciting about it you know no no massive turns off into you know a life of profligacy but in, <laughs> but here I am and looking back over it and go well you know the Lord has really done a lot of wonderful things Amen. and that is a great miracle uh, I consider that that I've not had that experience to walk away from the faith absolutely and I, and I really appreciate too that, you know that reflection on on your upbringing I know a lot more of your story has to do more later with your your Anglican background but even that as you said, that the Assemblies of God, the Pentecostal, again, there's stuff that we would say needs to be fulfilled or completed or fleshed out fully in the Catholic Church. But there are some real beautiful things there, that imminence of the Holy Spirit, you know, that sense of, uh, of needing to make it a personal, a personal decision at some point, decide, I'm going to take this seriously. I want to surrender my life to Jesus Christ. Those are things we, glory to God, whenever we hear that in a story. So wonderful. Yeah, and the other thing too that was really quite interesting is the um, the focus on spiritual warfare. Yeah, um, sometimes it can get a little out of hand, and that you're you know seeing a demon behind every bush, and it becomes something far more external to the self. Whereas as as Catholics, we would believe that there is a spiritual combat that takes place within the soul, and that's kind of the primary place we see it. Um, you know, when we talk about the three enemies of the soul: the world, the flesh, and the devil. Um, the flesh is actually a really big part of things. Um, and we do have, of course, the world and the devil who are external to us. But that awareness of the spiritual combat, the, necessary, um, the necessity of standing in the line of battle um, is, is really quite central to a lot of things, right. as well as you know, the concept of, of exorcism, um, angels, demons, the spiritual world you know, is something that was very living and present to me um, from an early age. So I'm deeply grateful for a lot of those, yeah. those early gifts. Uh, but in addition to an early commitment to, to Christ, I also, um, from an early age, and my mother would argue since before I was born, had, you know, had the sense of my vocation to ministry. And uh, that was just kind of a latent thing through most of my years growing up. And by the time I got to high school, um, it became more obvious to me I remember um, praying about it and was absolutely terrified of the idea of becoming a pastor. And I really found that the model of pastoral ministry in the Assembly of God was 
not something at all that I was interested in. And that was, that was the big turnoff. And I remember telling God in prayer once, I will do anything you want me to do. Just don't call me to ministry. What what was the parts of that model? You know, were. Yeah. So the the model that, you know, that I, that I grew up with was that everything really kind of centered around the pastor um, and his family. Uh, the, the homily was the central feature or the, you know, the, the sermon. Um, I, I loved music. I was, if, if I felt like the call was to something like, uh, music ministry, I would have been fine with that. That would have been great. You know, music is fun because it was very clearly not about me. It was about helping others, um, worship God. But the idea that, you know, the pastors, you know, the head honcho, he's the one that's running the whole parish or the, the congregation and uh, has to not only administer everything, and he's got all the different boards and lots of people who don't like him, and then a bunch of other people that really just love him. And there's just lots of high expectations. And I was not really interested in that in my teenage years. It would seem that without the sacraments in, like the, in the presence of a, of, a, of a worship service, even, even uh, uh, in, the, in the life of a pastor who's you know, very, you know, a good man, good-hearted man, it's hard for it not to end up being about his charisma and mm-hmm. his personality and his ability, right? Because there's Absolutely. not the sacramental presence of God there. It seems to put a lot of pressure on, on him. Yeah. And I had a wonderful pastor growing up. Um, I've, I've met up with him um, at a couple of points, you know, since, since we moved out of Ohio and uh, just a wonderful, a holy man who loves the Lord. And there yeah. was, so there's really nothing about him in particular right. that I saw that was really horrible or anything. It was just, that's not, how I feel like the Lord is calling me to sure. minister. And there was also just a deep personal sort of, this just doesn't fit. Yeah. So that was high school. The other thing that kind of happened during that time is um, the Assemblies of God, at least when I was there, you know, things would be kind of um, like Messianic Judaism was brought in to kind of spice, uh, spice the, the meal from the word of God uh, to help, you know, give some background because yeah. one of the, one of the difficulties of, of being a Protestant is that there was no sense of tradition. Everything was made up from week to week, and whatever you get out of, you know, the homily or the sermon is whatever the pastor came up with, whatever books that he's read, and there was no real sense of a depth of tradition. And so uh, the way that, that that deficiency sought to be remedied was by bringing in Messianic Judaism, and the Messianic was slapped on top of Judaism to just say that, well, you know, but we believe in Jesus. Right. It's not just straight up Judaism. And I'm actually tremendously grateful for that because that was kind of the beginning of a shift. And as I encountered Messianic Judaism through high school, that prompted me to study the Old Testament more, which then started raising questions like, well, what was the religion of Jesus? How did he worship God? What did he know about God? And um, how were his disciples raised? How did they pray? And as I grew in that knowledge of the Old Testament and studying um, rabbinic sources like Midrash and and Oral Torah and um, learned about the structure of rabbinic courts and all those other traditions, it became clear to me that the way that I had received Christianity looked very different from the religion of the apostles when they were, you know, boys, and the religion of our Lord when he was a young man. And so um, recognizing that the, the Jews use Hebrew as a liturgical language, they actually have a liturgy with set prayers. They use the Psalms extensively in their, in their liturgical worship, that there, is, there are community standards and that difficult passages in, in Scripture where it's important to know what Scripture demands of you but it's unclear as to how to specifically do it, the community decides how that's going to happen. And, um, and that was just something that I knew was just not present in my, in my upbringing. Right. It's so interesting, right, that uh, tradition as a word and a concept gets a bad, a bad rap amongst Protestants, but there's always this desire, this human desire, to, to rest on, to build on our forefathers, to build on what was received from us, to preserve it. To, and so... We're, we're, we're yearning for that. We're looking for that in our lives. There's actually a tremendous amount of anxiety when we don't have tradition because now it is every question is up to us to answer right. in our own way and according to our own lights. So 
the search for tradition um, began there. And I initially just accepted Messianic Judaism and, and its traditions and said, okay, this is, this is great, but the problem is I'm a Gentile. And I took Galatians very seriously and understood that uh, after a lot of prayer and discernment, I can't really become Jewish, and this is, this is contrary to the faith that I've received. So the question then became, how do I live in dialogue with this ancient tradition while I'm also a Gentile and can't really fully participate in it in the same sense that, that the Jews can because, well, they understood that they have these obligations. And when talking you know, to me as a Gentile, they would say, well, but you're not obligated to do that. Mm. And that was just always the kind of the refrain was, but you're not required to do that. You're not part of the, the Israelite covenant. So the, the question was, what do I do? And uh, that's when uh, a friend of mine introduced me to the church fathers, uh, people like Irenaeus and Ignatius and Clement. And so I began reading the apostolic fathers and I had been also concurrently been rediscovering my, uh, my dad's Missouri Synod uh, Lutheran hymnal from the 1950s, mm. which had the Nicene Creed and the Apostles' Creed right. and all of these beautiful prayers and an emphasis on psalmody and, and hymnody. And, and I remember looking at it thinking, why on earth do we not use the Apostles' Creed, just the Apostles' the shorter of the two, in our Assembly of God services? There's nothing in here that contradicts the scriptures. And it's a beautiful summary of our faith. And then something like um, the, the, the great hymn, Gloria in Excelsis Deo, Glory be to God on high. Why don't we sing that? It's the song of the angels. So immediately there, was, um, there were questions about why did we not have all of this stuff? And to be perfectly honest, I felt, uh, by the time I finished high school, I, I felt very much betrayed by um, the Assembly of God in that, not because for necessarily any any malice, but I felt like they'd been holding out on, on all the real goods. And um, so that impelled me to look deeper. And so I realized that there is an entire segment of Christianity that is, you know, the apostles had disciples and they trained them for ministry and they taught them. And then those disciples continued to hand on the faith down to our own day. And so I realized I had to find some kind of an uh, a church linked with the apostles. Right. We're speaking tonight with Father Stephen Hilgendorf, former Anglican priest. You know, had you uh, a question there? You know, uh, well, two questions. First of all, where were you in your life at this point in terms of were you at college? Were you married? So this was right about the the tail end of high school. Okay. And uh, I took a gap year after that to go to community college. Uh, where I took some classes in German and mathematics, just trying to get a head start on some of the, the liberal arts core, and also trying to figure out where I wanted to go to college. Sure. The other question, again, as these, when you start asking one question, it's interesting, right? Because the question is, it, it opens up more questions about, well, why don't we have these things? Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, did you identify as a Protestant? Oh, absolutely. Okay, so yeah. you had a sense of at least at least part of your tradition was protesting. Yes. Right. Okay. Yes, yeah. and you know, so my mother was raised in an Italian Roman Catholic family. My dad was of of good German stock and raised in the Missouri Synod Lutheran Church, and so um, and subsequently, I found out that that's actually not an uncommon uh, mixed religious marriage in in the Assemblies of God and in a number of other Protestant mm -hmm. denominations as well. So I was. Though the, um, my home environment was not anti-Catholic, it was also, um, it was suspicious. I remember growing up, you know, hearing, you know, things about um, um, members of my extended family who were uh, said to be like, well, we hope they'll go to heaven, you know, even though they're Catholic. And uh, so there, there was just this sense that yeah. the, um, you can go to heaven if you're Catholic, but it's not the optimal way to go. Right. Yeah. So we weren't entirely hostile, but we definitely made our, our opinions known that the yeah. Catholic Church was not not the place to be if you were really serious about Jesus. So and then at this this time after high school, this 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 period of your life, you're starting to have the sense of okay, well, I need to know why I'm not doing these things. Why why am I protesting? Why? Right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. 
Yeah, so when I went to college uh, full time, and at uh, I, actually, I went to Hillsdale College, uh, it was a wonderful school. I had a great time there. Um, my my freshman year, I continued attending um, uh, services at at the local Assembly of God uh, church, and um, the pastor there was a wonderful fellow. You know, and other the other pastors were also great, and um, but I was still not finding the answers to my questions there. And my uh, freshman year classes were reading Lewis. We were reading um, the you know, things about the Roman Republic. And you know, there's an entire um, liberal arts core at Hillsdale that's very um, great book centered. And it just kept raising new questions about all kinds of things. And I was not finding the answers to any of that um, in, in AG. And so the only place, so I actually stopped going to church for a while. Um, I stopped going to church for about a month. And it was one of the worst months of my life because there had, I felt acutely this hole in, um, in, in my life. Like I know I'm supposed to be doing something, um, but I was just trying to get over that, that, that barrier that said, you should be doing something, but I'm not really keen about where I'm at right now. Um, so at that point, when things finally kind of came to head, I said, I really need to do something about this. I need to find a place that I can belong. I will find a place. So I attended a local Baptist church. I attended a local Methodist church. I tried out the local Catholic church, and I tried out the local Anglican church, but not right away. Actually, I kind of saved Anglicans for the last, and I was... I was turned off by the by the Catholic parish. Um, I was not keen on the music. Um, I was not uh, keen on much of it. it was just it was foreign to me, and my and I, I didn't want to you know cross swords with my mother on the subject. And, right. Um, the the ba local Baptist church seemed pretty good. You know, they had decent hymnody. The preaching was good. A bunch of my college friends were going there, and so it was it was kind of a happy place to settle for a while. And and I still kept asking the questions and kept getting deeper into the fathers. I was also uh, periodically on high holy days going out to a, uh, a Messianic Jewish congregation in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and that was uh, another wonderful experience, you know, just getting into the lived traditions rather than it being just something that you read on paper, actually seeing what does a traditional synagogue liturgy look like. Right. And then uh, I took a class uh, called Introduction to Western Religion. And uh, mind you, I'm still very resistant to the idea of ministry. And the class, I just ate it up. It was fascinating. I was learning, yes, all about all kinds of different Western religions, you know, primarily Catholicism or Christianity and Judaism and, and Islam. But we also dug into a little bit of the, you know, the ancient Near Eastern and you know, pagan religions and um, as well as kind of tracked through the history of Christianity and um, Islam and Judaism through to the present. And it was just very eye-opening, and I came away with a profound sense that, well, maybe I should study religion. Maybe that, maybe I can appease God by just saying, I'll, I'll study religion. I'll, I'll become a theologian. I'll be a professor. How about that? And that will that work for you, God? And uh, <laughs> about the same time, I also discovered the Book of Common Prayer, uh, which was the, uh, the, the prayer book of, of, the, of the Anglican tradition. And because prior to this point, I'd been trying to develop my own sort of Gentile, but Messianic Jewish inspired liturgies for morning and evening prayer. And then I discovered the prayer book and said, well, I don't need to do that. <laughs> Everything that I would want to include is already here, except for maybe a handful of you know, specifically Jewish prayers. And I put, hey, this is great. And then, oh, look, there's this group of Anglican students who pray morning prayer at 730 in the morning. And so I, I joined that group and um, it was primarily student-led, but the uh, but the local Anglican priest, who was also the chaplain at the college, was was also kind of a steady, uh, faithful presence there, and um, that was a very enriching experience. So, over that period of time, I didn't actually go to the Anglican Church until I was probably a junior uh, in college. Uh, Doctor, uh, no, Father uh, Michael Ward at that time was um, an Anglican priest yeah. who had uh, come to the college and had. Is, I think he's. I think his title at the college now is something like visiting, uh, visiting teaching fellow, 
and uh, he taught a seminar on C.S. Lewis that I did not attend. <laughs> and um, but and I was really really quite bummed that I didn't get to attend it. Um, but I heard that he was going to be uh, preaching at the local Anglican parish, so I went there, uh, which was my first time darkening the door of the place. And um, to be honest, and you know, I, I really don't remember anything that uh, Father Ward said mm -hmm. in his homily, but what I do remember was how that didn't matter because the service was not about the homily. The homily was there in service of something else. Um, the, the beauty of the architecture was, was stunning. It was very simple, a sort of carpenter Gothic style. And uh, for those of your listeners who you know, may be familiar with you know, the, the geography of, of um, uh, southeastern uh, Wisconsin, there's, a, there's a parish, an Episcopal parish called St. John Chrysostom uh, near Delafield. That's my parish in Hillsdale was basically modeled off of that parish. Just beautiful. Uh, stained glass, uh, the vestments were decent, you know, the, the, uh, the liturgical linguistic idiom was uh, elevated. And the hymnody, you know, they sang all the verses of all the hymns and, and they loved good traditional hymnody. The music was great, the liturgy was wonderful, the preaching was passable. And it struck me that the central feature of the church was the altar. And right. I knew the priest, but in the end, my understanding of how things worked was that the priest was important, but the personality of the specific man wearing the vestments disappeared and was veiled by not only the vestments, but by the very words of the liturgy itself. Right. So. Yeah, it's, it's such a shift in, in worldview. It's a shift mm -hmm. in trying to understand what, what is the shape of Christian worship that I'm longing for, right? And when you encounter something very different there, a very different relationship between what we're doing as human beings uh, in relation to God's action in the liturgy. Um, that was certainly, that was sparking something that you'd been longing for, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so, you know, as I'm encountering all of these things in the writings of the Fathers, the Book of Common Prayer, um, encountering a sacramental understanding of the world, uh, the, this was really kind of peeling back the layers and answering a lot of Protestant objections. And now, and of course, in tandem with this, I'm having lots of discussions with my, with my classmates um, on, you know, in, across the different years uh, that I was there. And among them were a number of Catholics. Um, and this was really kind of the first time in my life that I'd actually gotten to know Catholics outside of my own family and uh, recognized that they were uh, quite faithful and loved our Lord to the death um, in a way that I had never seen before. And that was remarkable to me. And, you know, they would, they would be up at, you know, nine, 10 o'clock at night praying the rosary in the chapel, which I thought was insane <laughs> because number one, the rosary, isn't that just that prayer that keeps getting repeated ad nauseum at, at funerals. And why on earth are you doing that at nine, 10 o'clock at night while you should be studying or while you should be, you could be hanging out with, with friends. And, but they were taking the time to pray. And um, so I, th I thought that was remarkable. They were, they were very keen on going to mass um, and they had, had their priest come and celebrate mass for them on campus uh, periodically. And uh, that said, despite the fact I had some great relationships and we had wonderful, very interesting conversations and to the point that I would describe that my early years as an Anglican was strongly influenced by not only the Oxford movement and uh, the, the subsequent ritualist and Anglo-Catholic movements in the Anglican world, but that it was also profoundly influenced by Roman Catholicism. Right. Um, but in addition to them, I also had a number of Eastern Orthodox friends and uh, some of them were also Protestants who became Orthodox while we were at college together. And I remember uh, going to Divine Liturgy with them uh, a number of times, as well as to some of the pre-sanctified liturgies during Lent. And so encountering the, the, the Eastern um, liturgies and that whole wing of the church uh, was very influential um, in terms of my understanding of developing a sacramental worldview. Right. Well, we know the story doesn't end there, but let's take a quick break. Sounds uh, good. And we'll, we'll hear what happens next. All right.
Okay, we're joined tonight by Father Stephen Hilgendorf, and we'll be back in a minute to, to hear the rest of his story. Uh, I want to remind you that if you are on a journey, if you're thinking about becoming Catholic, or you're new to the faith, or you're just asking questions, perhaps this story is arousing some questions in you, uh, check out chnetwork.org, and particularly click Community, because we have a whole group of people, uh, converts and journeyers, who are walking that journey together, and we'd love to be praying for you. Uh, and walking with you, helping to answer your questions, but most of all, just trying to help encourage you to, to keep taking the next step in that journey. So check out chnetwork.org. We'll be back in just a minute to hear the rest of Father Stephen Hilgendorf's story. See you then. Welcome back to the Journey Home program. We're entering the second half of the hour today, talking to Father Stephen Hilgendorf, former Anglican priest. Uh, great story so far, Father. Really, really appreciate uh, it. You know your, your background in the Assemblies of God Church, but now in encountering both the early church fathers as well as this this deeper stream of liturgy and worship. Uh, really interesting stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. So excited to hear the rest of it. So, uh, what happens next? Today? Right. So I've. Kind of been introduced to the Anglican Church, and um, I ended up eventually making my home there, you know, rather permanently. And one of the one of the things that struck me that was so different about it, in addition to you know formalized liturgy, elevated language, um, you know, a clear authority structure, um, in all in many ways, all the stuff that I was looking for. Um, that kind of mimicked what was going on in the Messianic Jewish world. The other thing that was really quite remarkable about it was that we were having the Eucharist every Sunday, yeah. as opposed to uh, once a month, once a quarter, maybe a couple times a year. Uh, and it really kind of depended, you know, when I was growing up in the Assemblies of God, you know, it all was totally up to the pastor. Well, and, and what was the significance of that for you? Like, what did you believe about the Eucharist? So as I was growing in my knowledge of not only the scriptures, but also the fathers, it became clear that the Eucharist was the central feature of the life of the church and that it's more than just a symbol, that there is actually some kind of encounter with the risen Christ that is going on there in that ordinance, as I would have called it back then. And when you kind of understand that this is really not just an opportunity for you to um, cultivate feelings of remorse or contrition, but a real or even even a sense of an ephemeral sense of love for the Lord or an appreciation of his sacrifice, but that this is actually Christ whom you are encountering. It, it, this is the only thing you want to do when you gather on a Sunday morning uh, yeah. as, as the body of Christ. You want to gather for the sacraments. Now, of course, I didn't really realize at this time that, um, you know, the Anglican Church and its history with the Roman Catholic Church, I was getting into some of that history of, you know, how the, uh, how the schism occurred and what happened in the loss of apostolic succession and some of those other things. But I was not really overly concerned about it. Um, and I suppose that was probably a grace at, at that time. It kind of seems strange to say so now, but... The Lord allows us, I think, to encounter things uh, when we need to. Absolutely. Yeah. And um, certain things will be more important to us at one stage than at another. And so in retrospect, you'll wonder, why on earth did I think that? Or why did I do it that way? That was really stupid. But in the end, um, so long as we're being docile to the leading of the Holy Spirit, He will lead us and guide us into all truth. So. Amen. <laughs> so there I am. I, I make my home in the Anglican Anglican Church, and you know, this is closer to the end of my um, my four years at, at college, and the local priest there identifies the vocation that I've been running from. He says, "You know, Stephen, you would look really good in black." <laughs> and I said, "Yeah, no thanks," <laughs> and uh, went on with my life. Except that the the comment kept niggling in the back of my mind, you know, like you know it's right. You need to go back and talk to him about it. And then he said it again about a couple weeks later or something. And I said, you know, Father, we need to talk. And he said, okay, let's set up a time. And uh, so we had a conversation about things. And he said, well, you're going to be serving on the altar. 
and uh, we'll we'll kind of train you in on on the liturgy and and uh, just get you closer to where the the sacrifice is happening, so you can actually experience what what that prayer is like because it's going to be different. I said, how different can that be? So I, I was a little skeptical, but um, at the same time, I was quite excited, you know. So I got you know fitted out with a cassock and surplus and was serving at the altar every Sunday and learned all the different roles. And before too long, uh, was uh, given permission to uh, serve the subdiaconal ministry. And uh, that was uh, a life-changing experience. Um, I remember a number of months later, uh, the priest asked me, like, so what is it like? How, is, how are you praying? Is it, is it different? And uh, I said, it's completely different. He said, you remember that Sunday I, I, I arrived late or I wasn't able to serve and I sat in the pews? He said, oh, yeah. I said, it was really different. I, the way I have prayed has changed, and for the better. Um, just being closer to the, the actual offering of, of, of the bread and the wine um, yeah, with, with the prayers of consecration, having that intimate relationship that, of proximity with the sacrifices that's going on. And so he was pleased by that, and I ended up serving in a number of different capacities within the parish before, um, before I graduated. I took another gap year. Um, I was discerning marriage at the time and, and was not, um, ended up deciding against that particular path at that time and uh, ended up doing some substitute teaching had a few affairs to, you know, um, to get in order before I went to seminary, and uh, so I went to uh, I went to seminary in uh, southeastern Wisconsin, a place called Neshota House, an Episcopal seminary, and my uh, experience there was also very good, and it was more formation in the church fathers, the liturgy. Um, we were praying morning and evening prayer and and uh, the Eucharist every day, and. You know, it, it boggled my mind that there were some of the students there who really chafed at the idea of being in chapel every day because, to my mind, this was what I had already been doing and the reason why I wanted to be here, not just at, at seminary in general, but at this specific seminary because it was I knew that it was going to provide the most Catholic, the most traditional formation that I, you know, that I was wanting. And... Um, I, I deeply appreciated, you know, my my professors. Um, I learned a whole lot about a lot of different things, and um, I could have learned so much more if I was even more diligent and applied myself even better to my studies. But um, it was a it was a near total formation experience. Um, my experience there, and in subsequent conversations with other you know Catholic priests who had been to um, other Protestant seminaries. The formation was very different. It was not strictly intellectual. It was also spiritual. Um, it's it was more like what a Catholic priest gets at at a Catholic seminary, with the exception that there was not as much emphasis on human formation as right. there probably could or should have been. But um, it was still a a life changing experience, and I re that this was um, I began encountering. Eucharistic adoration as a practice when I was in college, but it was only ever done on Maundy Thursday. At seminary, it was a more regular occurrence and was something that a number of the more pious uh, students would engage in on a very regular basis. And so that's where that practice really kind of began for me. And uh, so seminary was a wonderful time of spiritual growth. Uh, it was also at that time that um, I met my wife. Uh, she was the younger sister of uh, a seminary and a year ahead of me and a fellow choral scholar. And uh, so he and I had known one another fairly well over you know the first couple of years of my of my um, of my studies at, yeah. at Nashoda. And so she had returned. I'd initially met her during or, or at least had seen her during my first year of studies. Uh, but we hadn't really talked, hadn't really got to know one another. Uh, but she ended up returning uh, to the seminary um, in the second semester of my of my second year, and um, because her, one of her younger brothers had been uh, tragically killed in a car accident, and 
-hmm. She wanted to be back at Nashota House where there was a stability to you know, its rule of life sure. and um, its rule of prayer. And so she was back there for that. And I began seeing her more at some of the other social engagements, but primarily at the chapel. And I found that was particularly remarkable. What is this pious young woman doing here at our chapel when so many other people are just, it grates on them to be here. And um, in general, the families didn't really frequent you know, the chapel as much. Uh, maybe they do now, but um, I found that very, very notable. And I was still very much interested in marriage, uh, but I was also having some some questions about the sort of um, approach that Anglicans have to the idea of marriage and ministry in that you can pretty much get ordained and then get married and it, there are no rules attached and, or anything like that. And I was discovering the ancient tradition of the church that married men may be ordained, but once you're ordained, you don't remarry. Um, if, for instance, if your wife should die. Right. So um, we ended up... Um, actually meeting in 2013 uh, and we're married that same year and I finished out my studies there and it was during that time that I first really began to take the Roman Catholic Church seriously. Mm -hmm. I had a number of classmates um, as well as some um, people in the class ahead of me and behind me who were deeply uh, studying the claims of, of uh, uh, Petrine primacy right. and Matthew chapter 16 and we're having some very startling answers to provide. Um, I remember one of my classmates told me, you have to listen to Scott Hahn's analysis <laughs> of Matthew 16. I said, okay, fine. And so I listened to it and it was deeply unsettling to me because he did a very systematic takedown of the most common objections to, um, to the role of the Pope. Now at this time, my, I practically believed everything that the Catholic Church taught except uh, for the that the Immaculate Conception was de fide, meaning that you have to believe this for your salvation, that it's the truth and therefore not optional. I believed it, but I didn't believe that it was actually the truth in that binding kind of way. And I certainly didn't believe that the Pope had the authority to bind the consciences of the faithful. Um, the other thing, too, was that I didn't believe that the Pope was what the Church says he is. Um, First among equals, great. The Anglican Church is just like the Orthodox Church. We're just a branch of, of the One Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church. No difference at all. We don't really need the Pope except to kind of just corral us together every now and again for an ecumenical council. And really even that, we've had seven, so we're good. Right. Um, so in, in my own sort of ecclesiology, I kind of had this sort of quasi-branch theory and sort of Orthodox ecclesiology and... Um, so this was a deeply unsettling experience for me. Um, fast forward about a year or two, I'm finally into parish ministry as, a, as an ordained priest, and I am catechizing all of my people out of the uh, Catechism of the Catholic Church, second edition. <laughs> and whenever troublesome moral questions would come up, where was I going to look? I was looking to the Roman Magisterium for the answers to my questions about faith and morals. Um, a friend of mine from seminary recommended that I read uh, 33 Days to Morning Glory and get into the spirituality of Marian consecrations, which I thought was a little weird, but I thought, you know, if Justin's recommending it, I'll, I'll look into it. And that was, that initiated a profound shift in my understanding of the Immaculate Conception. Right. Um, I, I really, really struggled uh, with it. So the chapter on uh, the week on um, St. Maximilian and Colby was profoundly impactful as a, as a time to really do some wrestling with God about what is this whole Immaculate Conception thing? Is this even kosher? And that was very influential for me. Um, what ended up finally fixing it was, uh, it was during the Christmas octave one year, I was reading through Hans Urs von Balthasar's um, essay in, his, uh, in, in a book that was uh, published with some writings by then uh, Cardinal Ratzinger uh, called Mary, the Church at the Source. And there were just a few lines in a few paragraphs in the opening parts of his essay that I, I had attempted to read this essay before but never got through the whole thing. Well, I devoured it during this particular octave and they jumped out at me as being the answer to the question as to, oh, this is why we believe in the Immaculate Conception. It is It does actually have 
consequences for Christology. Um, so after that, I, I really, the only thing left was my resistance to papal authority. And then what did that for me was um, my brother-in-law and uh, some friends of his had recommended that I read a book uh, by Vladimir Soloviev called uh, The Russian Church and the Papacy. Hmm. I think Catholic Answers published a version that you know, yeah. abridged it, and so that was the version I read. And I got about a chapter or two into it, and I realized what his line of argument was probably going to be. I shut the book, put it on the shelf, and I told my wife, I cannot read this book. If I read this book, I will be obliged in conscience to become Catholic. I'm just, I'm certain of it. <laughs> So, because here I am, I'm the rector of, yeah. of, of a, uh, probably the second largest parish in the diocese at the time. I was on, this, on the diocesan standing committee as its vice president and um, very much enjoyed the particular Anglican diocese I was in. To give you kind of a picture of the kind of, of brother priests I had then, um, there was actually a Messianic Jewish rabbi that came to visit uh, for us as we were doing one of our clergy formation gatherings and, and he asked us what we thought about those those books of the Old Testament that, you know, you know, are they scripture, are they not scripture? And what do you call those things? He didn't really quite remember what the word was, whether it was like Apocrypha or Deuterocanon. And, and one of the priests, uh, who was actually just a, a consecrated a bishop, answered very boldly, we call it inspired scripture. So we were right. in that kind of a camp that, you know, the, all of these books, this is all good for us. Yeah. Um, so I really liked being there. I didn't want to leave. Um, I loved my parish. Um, granted, they had their faults, and like so did I, and like we were all trying to grow in one particular direction. I was trying to lead them more and deeper into the Anglo-Catholic tradition. But uh, it became very clear over time that I had gone somewhere um, in my faith uh, that the parish was not willing to follow. Uh, it was clear that I had taken a stand on certain moral issues pertaining to like abortion, contraception, uh, a lot of the Humani Vitae stuff that was not necessarily something that would get me fired, but it was, it was not palatable. Yeah. And so, you know, there were some pastoral, um, uh, so I could have handled some things in a more pastoral way for sure, but it was, but those those infelicities were opportunities for me to, is kind of like markers realizing, right. oh, I'm way out here, and they're way back here. Bit, yeah. So that was, that was the moment I realized I need to start packing my bags. And so I finally picked up Soloviev again. I finished the book. I said, yep, I do need to become Catholic. <laughs> and so um, I was in parish. Well, and what, and what, just but what in particular yeah. there was the kind of the clincher of that book that you saw? His retelling of church history uh -huh. and the specifically why the heresies developed and who was really promoting them. And so he kind of cast it in the light of um, the heresies were being promoted by the emperors uh, for the most part because this was just the nature of the Roman Imperium at the time was that the, the emperor was always the high priest and there was always this divine cult associated with the emperor and so a lot of what happens with the Christological heresies is that it makes religion something separate from the Roman state which then allows the emperor to assume his former position as the head of all things. Uh, therefore kind of usurping the place of Christ the King. So that just completely destroyed my, you know, sort of orthodox-ish, quasi-Anglican, quasi-orthodox understanding of, of how the church worked and how doctrine was established, and particularly the role of the Pope as being a guarantor of the, of the truth, of, of the gospel and of yeah. the unity of the church. Um, and again, that sacramental worldview, that the gospel is not an abstract idea, but that the gospel is an incarnate reality within the church right. okay. and in its hierarchy. So uh, this led me to um, reappraising the whole, the whole deal. How much longer can I remain as an Anglican? Um, I had been hoping to retire and then become a Roman Catholic. But then my wife and I, as we were both kind of digging into some of the stuff, were realizing we cannot wait until we retire. We have children. Do If we wait until we retire, raise our children to be faithful Anglicans and then leave and become Catholic, then are we not just 
providing them with a lie or at least, or at best a half truth? What will this do to their faith if we witness to them, by the way, kids, we've been planning to become Catholic our whole life. Everything we've taught you, not everything we've taught you, but this is not really where you need to be. And you know, what kind of a message does that send to my parishioners as well? So I was very keenly aware of the responsibility that I had toward God. Um, and I was, and I lived in terror of the day when Matthew 16 would come up in the lectionary <laughs> and I would feel in conscience bound to expound upon who the Pope actually is. So during this time we had been attending a, um, a local um, ordinary uh, community uh, which had been established while I was in college and had dismissed out of hand as being, oh, that's not going to be you know, a thing. And, um, but lo and behold, here's this little community in, in, uh, in the Twin Cities at where, where I had been in ministry. So I was attending this community and got to know the priest. And uh, I was particularly intrigued by the fact that the ordinariate was actually making good on the promises that Pope Benedict XVI had made when he issued his apostolic constitution, Anglicanorum Cetibus, back in 2009. And that was that the Anglican patrimony and including its rights and its spirituality um, would be, uh, and, its, and its parochial in a form of life and its in a pastoral accents and ministry would be uh, respected, received, and made a part of the living uh, Catholic tradition. And I saw it all there. And like, I remember when uh, Divine Worship the Missal came out in 2015, I was there when Monsignor Steenson you know, paid a visit Right. Uh, in early Advent and blessed the Missal. And I remember you know, hearing all the familiar uh, words and phrases uh, of the liturgy that I celebrated every Sunday. And I thought, well, that was a really good adaptation of what we're doing. In fact, when I got my hands on a Missal, one of my parishioners actually went and bought me a copy of the altar missile, which you know was like three, four, five hundred dollars or something, and said, oh, Father, I just want you to read this thing and, and tell me what you think about it. I studied it and was impressed. I, the, I, I told a seminary colleague, I said, you know, um, you and I have talked extensively about revising the Book of Common Prayer. This is what the missile would look like if you and I had our way. Wow. So I was, um, I found that it was exactly what I was looking for. I mean, there were little places here and there where, you know, you can quibble, but yeah. um, it was a beautiful gift. Um, so I was already kind of open to that as a possibility. Um, the, so I started looking for different things to do because I realized if I leave, I need to support my family somehow. And that was, uh, that was a big deal. My wife was chomping at the bit, ready and rearing to go. And I was just like, well, let's wait a minute. We need to figure out how we're going to live. And so I started off by maybe looking into CPE, but then that turned out, um, not to be, I felt like that was not the direction the Lord wanted me to go. It felt like the Lord had told me to wait and to stay. And um, so I waited for a while. Um, I was also really afraid of what it would be like because I knew that becoming Catholic, I would enter as a layman. I would not be entering as a priest. Right. And that I would have to give up um, that vocation with no guarantee that I would ever be able to exercise it again in the Catholic Church. And, but that was... I was trained in, you know, a theology of priesthood that was very similar to that of the Catholic one, in that you were a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Um, once you're ordained, you were always a priest, even if you stop exercising your ministry. So that was um, a prospect that I did not look forward to. Yeah. Um, so I, I have a great deal of sympathy for, you know, a lot of Catholic priests who have, you know, had to go through the laicization process, and I understand where that, what that kind of feels like, not to the same degree, but it's uh it's not fun in fact um when we did finally become catholic i remember sitting in the pews um for about a month in between you know leaving and becoming uh, becoming catholic and i hated being there it was just like this dark black cloud hovering over my head uh, this is one of the reasons why the coming home network was started by my, yeah. my father you know becoming a, a catholic and leaving his pastorate behind again a little bit of the same, right? The sense that this is my my, den uh, my identity, my, my mm -hmm. life, my vocation. And that's a big challenge, a big sacrifice, uh, a big step in humility for someone to lay that down, as you said, without any promise necessarily that that would yeah. be taken back up. So 
got about five minutes left. Sure. Um, how did that? Uh, how did that conclude? Did you... So I ended up uh, going to a diocesan synod in 2017 and and told. Um, my bishop that I had just been elected as president to the standing committee. I was clearly being groomed for some kind of uh, succession plan in the diocese. And um, it was, uh, it, w it had become crystal clear to my wife and I, we'd been praying the Pentecost novena on repeat for a good month or two in advance of this, because we knew that something was building and we needed to make a decision. And so I talked with him about it. Um, contrary to all my expectations, he was very gracious about it, um, gave me plenty of time to get my affairs in order and make a final decision. Um, Bishop Lopes uh, came up to the Twin Cities in, um, in September of 2017, and I finally called my bishop and said, yeah, that this is what I'm going to do. And so he outlined how I was going to separate from my parish, um, and that was, that was a very difficult thing to do. Uh, preaching, preaching my last homily to them and saying goodbye was one of the hardest things I've ever done. Um, it was one of the hardest things that they probably ever had to sit and, and listen to. Um, but they very graciously gave me a three-month severance package, which was um, one of the things I will be eternally grateful to them uh, because I was unemployed for three months. Um, I, we lived off of not only my former parish's charity, but the charity of a number of other uh, Catholic parishioners who had Heard about our, heard about us, heard our story. People would just turn around in the pew in front of us and like hand us a, a you know, a check or cash, and he's like, here, this is you know, Christmas gifts for your children, and oh, by the way, and here's to help with your grocery bills and That's things like that. So I ended up landing a job as a painter, uh, painting houses for about ten months, um, and that overlapped for a short period of time, doing some part-time work for a local Catholic parish before I became the director of faith formation at the Cathedral of Saint Paul another institution to which I'll be eternally grateful. Uh, so I was there uh, teaching RCIA and uh, helping to coordinate religious education for about three years. During that time, I was um, invited by the ordinariate to come down and interview to enter formation uh, for the Catholic priesthood. And uh, so I did some of my seminary formation at St. Paul Seminary in, uh, in Minnesota. Uh, while I was also at the same time working a full-time job and, and uh, trying to keep a family together and under a roof. And then, uh, so I was ordained to the priesthood June 29th of 2021. And uh, July 1st of that same year was appointed as the parochial administrator of St. Barnabas Catholic Church in Omaha, Nebraska, and was just installed as its pastor this past September. Oh, beautiful, Father. Wow. It, it, it's so, it's, the stories are always so different. You know, it, it is so interesting you know, in yours, even the, even coming into the church, right? There's almost just this, this last little punctuation mm -hmm. mark on this long journey of God preparing you and your spirituality and your liturgy. Um, again, with a couple minutes left, you know, just talk a little bit about, well, I guess I, maybe most importantly, speak to someone who's perhaps coming from the backgrounds that you have. What's mm -hmm. a word of encouragement uh, you could give to them about continuing their journey? Yeah, so one of the things that really struck me is that Apostolic succession is kind of a core thing, especially for me as, as, as a former Anglican priest. And I kind of put a lot of stock into it being a pedigree. But then over time, I realized it's not just the pedigree. It's also communion with the apostles as well as their teaching. And that you can't really have anywhere outside the Catholic Church. And even though we've got all the nice stuff, the nice liturgy, the nice vestments, it's aesthetically pleasing. There is, there is no greater joy um, or peace uh, or delight that can be found outside uh, the church. And in fact, I was very happy as, as a Catholic layman before it became very clear that God was calling me back into uh, a form of ordained ministry and specifically in, in the Catholic priesthood. So um, is it painful? Yes. Uh, but laying down uh, one's priesthood is actually a participation in the priesthood of Jesus Christ. Um, because that sacrifice of that Anglican priesthood was a sacrifice offered um, in service of the unity of the church and, um, in, and the splendor of truth. That's beautiful. Thank you so much, Father, for your story. You're very welcome. As well as for your witness and, and, um, and your, you know, your courage in continuing that journey, laying that down, as you said, for the, for the unity of the church. Like that's what 
in the end, our, our little obedience, it can seem small and difficult at the time, but it, it contributes. It's part of the whole communion of saints. So thank you so much for that. And thank you for joining us for this episode of the Journey Home Program. You know, I have about a thousand more things I'd like to talk to Father about. We didn't have time to get into too many of them tonight because it's <laughs> such a good story. Uh, if you check out chnetwork.org, we have a, a lot of follow-up videos with, with some of uh, some of these converts that we talked to. And so we'll probably have uh, some good conversations with Father. We'll post some of those up there at chnetwork.org. But as always, I pray that Father's, uh, Father's story was an inspiration to you. And we'll be back next week with more stories. So God bless you. See you then.